Welcome back to Mayo Clinic Radio. I'm Dr. Tom Shives. And I'm Tracy McCray. A study published this summer in Mayo Clinic Proceedings found that the risk of having a heart attack while pregnant, while giving birth, or during the two months after delivery continues to increase for American women. Hmm. The study, led by NYU School of Medicine researchers, found that the risk of suffering a heart attack among pregnant women rose 25 percent from 2002 to 2014. Possible reasons for this increase include women having children later in life and more women being obese and or even diabetic, which are key risk factors for heart disease. And here to discuss is Mayo Clinic cardiologist, Dr. Sharon Hayes. Welcome back to the program, Dr. Hayes. It's nice to have you here. It's great to be here. Dr. Hayes, nice to see you. So these have to be alarming statistics, don't you think? So they're very alarming. If we think about in the U.S., we have a higher maternal mortality rate than most developed countries anyway, uh, for a lot of reasons. And then we look at the heart disease risk, which is my interest, Um, The fact that it is rising is concerning, largely because we believe that most cardiovascular disease and heart attacks can be prevented. So with the alarming, I think there are some action items that we need to be looking for as well. Is there a a racial discrepancy here also? I mean, uh, are there more black women who have heart disease uh, during pregnancy and delivery than, than white women? So there's a con- there is a disparity, and the disparities have to do with race, particularly African American women who have about triple the death rate overall for maternal mortality, um, and an increase in in cardiovascular mortality, but also just access and prenatal care. There's so many things that have to do with this that are both risk factors and age of the mother, but also things about our systems of care or lack thereof. Now, Tracy mentioned a couple of the possible reasons, and diabetes, obesity. Uh, what, what, what would you say? Well, I think it's clear that, and we've known this for a long time, is the older you are as a mother, the higher risk the pregnancy is, and the higher risk the mother is for having underlying heart disease to start the pregnancy. And so we're seeing older mothers. We're seeing people who are having children at ages that really they didn't have them before. And that is sort of that one of those high risk groups that we could we should look at. There's been a rate of rise in the risk factors, particularly obesity um, and diabetes, which are powerful and are not necessarily screened for and treated during pregnancy. So one of the other things we've learned is that overweight women can lose weight healthily during a pregnancy and have a healthier baby and a healthier them, but they have to be under the appropriate care. You had mentioned that the mortality rates for pregnant women are not the best compared to other advanced civilizations around the world. Um, Is that because women in the U.S. are having babies later? Part of it is the older age uh, of women in the U.S., but many of these countries, we're talking about Scandinavia Mm -hmm. and Great Britain and others, um, that there was a quote uh, from a U.K. comment where they were looking at maternal mortality. They said that actually the rate or risk of death of the unpregnant father is now greater than the pregnant woman in the U.K., and we can't say that about Hmm. the U.S., Wow, that's so it's, that's interesting, isn't it? Yeah, that's pretty in powerful. The UK. And and why do you think that is their system compared to ours? Well, I you know their system of care, their access to care. Every woman has a has a primary care doctor. Every woman is going to get the appropriate care. That's not true in the U.S. Hmm. Hmm. Um, so, uh, what should women do uh, before they become pregnant, particularly if they're obese or have diabetes? Well, I think they should see either their OB or their primary care doctor, if they have one, and have some preconception planning. What does a healthy pregnancy look like? What are my risk factors? If I'm really overweight, am I, you know, in general, we don't advise those women to have the same 30-pound weight gain um, that uh, an individual who is normal weight would have. So what does a healthy pregnancy look like for me? And then monitoring through the pregnancy to make sure that we identify those individuals who develop hypertension, new hypertension during pregnancy or new diabetes during pregnancy. And importantly, and a slightly off topic, but definitely related is individuals who during their pregnancy, women who during pregnancy develop hypertension or diabetes, even if it goes away after they deliver, are at higher risk for a heart attack throughout their entire life. 
And so that marks a woman who failed the stress test of pregnancy, and we need to watch her. Maybe they need to see a cardiologist. Maybe they need lipid-lowering therapy or greater monitoring for their high blood pressure. So pregnancy is such an important time for women's health and baby's health, as well as her future heart health. How does pregnancy affect the heart? So a normal pregnancy, our, um, the woman's blood volume increases um, by about a third. So that means the heart has a lot of extra work. Um, blood pressure typically, actually in a normal pregnancy, goes down. Um, think about the uterus where the baby, it goes from a fist size um, organ to big enough to have a nine pound baby mm -hmm. in it. So women actually have this ability to make new blood vessels and uh, which, uh, so when they prove that they can do that, that's a pretty healthy thing. If they have a preterm birth or a baby that doesn't develop fully because their placenta isn't healthy enough, those are all markers of risk for that pregnancy, but also future pregnancies and future heart disease in that woman. Based on the statistics that we talked about, you suggested that maybe there are some things that we ought to be doing differently. Well, I think that preconception planning is really good. Talking to what are the health risks that I have that I can correct before I even get pregnant? What medications am I on? What medications should I, if I'm on medications, what should I switch to? I think making sure that women recognize that heart disease, that they are at risk for heart disease, right. and so that they pay attention to symptoms. I mean, one of the areas, and it's, it was a sizable number of the individuals who suffered a heart attack after um, a birth in this study that was referenced at the beginning of the segment, um, had a condition called spontaneous coronary artery dissection. This is an area of interest of mine. This happens in people with healthy hearts, with healthy vessels, with no cholesterol or anything. It is, um, so there's nothing to prevent it, but you gotta recognize the symptoms right away so you get in and get the appropriate treatment. So it's multi-level, it's pre, it's during, and making sure that we address the issues that arise, and then making sure that everyone on the team, including the patient, knows what the signs and symptoms are of heart disease. I think that's a great point because it's been a while. It's been a while since I was pregnant. <laughs> but the only long. thing <laughs> the only thing that I thought about before we got pregnant was to start taking folic acid. That was the only pre-planning that we did at all. And even as someone who's got some heart issues, I didn't even think about heart health when it came to being one of the things I should be watching out for when I was pregnant. Exactly. Hmm. So the big issues are obesity, the increasing rates of diabetes, and women having children when they're older. Would you suggest that if, if you're thinking about having children, maybe you ought to think about it early on? Well, that's great to say in theory, because sure. in general, healthier pregnancies are going to be in, in a woman's 20s. On the other hand, the reality is um, women find partners later or whatever. So I would say to that older woman, the woman who is 30 or 35 and coming into their first pregnancy, is that is even paying more attention because that's also the age in which we're starting to see more risk factors. And so would it probably be healthier to have pregnancy at younger ages? Yes. But the reality is we're going to have older mothers and continue to do so. So making sure those older mothers are as healthy as can be. All right, we've been talking about heart health and pregnancy with cardiologist, heart specialist, Dr. Sharon Hayes. Time for a short break. When we come back, we'll look at later in a woman's life, uh, heart health and menopause. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> Plus, myth or matter of fact, more than one in three adult women has some form of cardiovascular disease. <laughs> Welcome back to Mayo Clinic Radio. I'm Dr. Tom Shives. And I'm Tracy McRae. We're back talking about women and heart health with Mayo Clinic heart expert, heart specialist, Dr. Sharon Hayes. We've talked about pregnancy and the heart, but what about heart disease as women age, especially after menopause? Which leads us to our myth or matter of fact. More than one in three adult women has some form of cardiovascular disease. Oh, Dr. Hayes, is that a myth or a fact? <laughs> it would be a fact. Oh, boy. Is that a we, surprise for women when you talk about this? Absolutely. Yeah. And in that, in that statistic, we do include hypertension, which is uh, on the rise and increases with each year of age, particularly in women after menopause. Wasn't that a great segue? Uh-huh. <laughs> menopause. <laughs> Just one of those things that, again, like we said with childbirth, uh, I didn't really consider what heart health, what impact that might have on my pregnancy. I wouldn't think about it, about uh, menopause relation, but of course it is. Well, it is, and probably it's better known, honestly, mm -hmm. because we have, as women age, 
they, they have gotten this boost, perhaps a protection b- compared to men of about 10 years. They get about a 10-year grace. They present with high blood pressure and heart attacks on average about 10 years later than men. Now, there are some exceptions to that because women who are, are diabetic, actually it eliminates all of that advantage. But um, for instance, women's blood pressure tends to be lower than men up until about the age of menopause, around age 50. And then women's blood pressure starts going up. Men's stays high, but it levels off. So it is a time in life that is both a change related to changes in hormones, but I think pointing out it's not an abrupt change and abrupt uptick, but think about other things that happen to women around the uh, age 50, 51, which is the average age of menopause. Often they become empty nesters. They have changes in jobs, changes in physical activity. They get a bum knee or plantar fasciitis and they get less active. There are a lot of things that come around that time that can confound and worsen and increase risk for cardiovascular disease. Oh, it's a special time in woman's <laughs> life. <laughs> is it, uh, is, it's so does, freeing, though. It really is. I just feel free. <laughs> does estrogen help protect the heart? So, complicated question. Um, we believe so. Um, the endogenous or the estrogen that is in our bodies in, during the premenopausal state, we think that that is because there are estrogen receptors on every blood vessel in the body and it keeps women's blood vessels um, elastic and healthier. It's more complicated though in terms of, and I don't want any of the listeners to hear that, yes, oh, that means I should add estrogen back to protect my heart after menopause. So the Women's Health Initiative showed that at least in older women who were a few years past menopause, adding estrogen back didn't help them, mm. didn't help their hearts. Yeah. It may be, and this is the, the, the question, that continuing it at a low dose, if you've got an already healthy heart um, early after menopause might be something. But the general rule is we don't recommend adding estrogen back after menopause to protect the heart at this point. So let's talk about the, just review the risk factors again. And they're the same for, for men and women, mm-hmm. and they're the same risk factors essentially for erectile dysfunction and Alzheimer's disease, mm-hmm. interestingly. But uh, so diabetes, yes. obesity, high blood pressure. Smoking. Smoking, uh, sedentary lifestyle, lack of uh, activity, cholesterol. Yeah, cholesterol and triglycerides in women. So lipids as a whole, um, it, it um, the standard total cholesterol we've kind of moved away from and just saying well over 200 you have high cholesterol because you can have other factors in your uh, cholesterol that put you at higher risk Um, particularly for women elevated triglycerides um, which is another fat in the blood that is more influenced by dietary sugars um, and carbohydrates as opposed to fats and genetics the other is where you put on your fat Mm. so Women. I don't like this part. <laughs> <laughs> so you can be normal weight, but if you have a fat distribution that is mainly in your middle and your waistline as opposed in your hips and thighs, for women and for men, that conveys an increased risk. And so when you start gaining weight, um, even going from normal weight to higher weight, which often happens as we get older, um, puts women at even higher risk. How important is activity, uh, especially postmenopause? So when people ask me, what's the most important thing I can do to prevent heart disease? If they're a smoker, that's number one. Number two is physical activity. And the reason I say that is there's such um, deep and broad, strong evidence that it makes an impact, not only for cardiovascular disease, but for Alzheimer's and for bones and for osteoporosis and for preventing falls and being strong. So physical activity is great. The other part is it's never too late to start physical activity. We actually have scientific studies that say that women who start a a walking program over the age of 65 actually reduce their risk of heart disease from the nurse's health study. So it's free, it's not sexy, however, and it's a hard habit to adopt if Mm -hmm. you hate exercise, as some of my patients do. We, I, I just and friends. To, well, I was just going to say that uh, on Saturday, the, the gals that I run with, we all, a majority of us, if not every single one, started running in our 40s. Um, we are all either late 40s or early 50s. And we were talking about, can you imagine, all of us were imagining our mothers in their 50s 
none of them were physically active. I mean, they were doing other things. They were gardening. They were doing a lot of other things that we don't have time to do because we're working full time. But um, do you feel like, oh, do you feel like your patients are getting that message and are trying to become more active in midlife? So I think women are so busy. And one of the things, so the, the answer is yes, but. Okay. But I think getting back to why um, women don't take time to take care of themselves. Women are raised and acculturated to be caregivers. They're moms. They are, you know, they're the group leaders. They're often, even if they're in the workforce, they're the moms at work. And, and so often when we ask women, even who've had a heart attack, why don't you make this change or eat healthy or exercise? I don't have time because I'm driving my kids. Um, my husband wouldn't eat that healthy food, so I'm just going to make it. And so flipping it so that they know that if they can do those things, they will accomplish those other goals, i.e. caregiving, um, and making it an altruistic thing, which can be very helpful. Um, and that's been my biggest success in helping people frame it when I don't have time, because none of us have enough time to do these yeah. things. It's priorities. Mm -hmm. We've talked about uh, the, the major risk factors and how important it is to keep all of those under control, and exercise is extremely important. Let me ask you about a couple of other things with regard to heart disease prevention. And that is, uh, there's some recent, been some recent controversy, uh, a baby aspirin a day. What's your feeling about that in women who don't have a history of heart disease? So that's an important distinction to make because nothing has changed in terms of our recommendations. If you've had a heart attack, a stent, or have, uh, have had cardiovascular disease, you should be on a baby aspirin unless your doctor tells you otherwise. For individuals, male and female, particularly older individuals who are otherwise healthy, don't have diabetes, don't have other things, the risks of taking aspirin, and people don't think about that, they just, because it's non-prescription, mm -hmm. are actually greater or outweigh, or at least are equal to any benefit that one has. And that's stomach bleeding mainly. And stomach and other types of bleeding, bleeding. because it, it irritates the stomach, but also you can get bleeding into your brain. And women, in everything we do, and every medication and every intervention in cardiology, women bleed more. So if it's a risk for men, it's a bigger risk for women. All right, fish oil. Uh, fish oil was very popular um, uh, five or six years ago until we started actually having data from randomized clinical trials. So I, I ask, if I have somebody come into my office and they're on fish oil, I ask, why are you taking them? Because there are other reasons than heart disease you might take fish oil. But I tell them to stop it. But really? you Yeah because it's really not been shown to have any primary prevention benefit or really even secondary prevention. What if they don't like fish and they think, I don't like fish, so I'll just take fish oil tablets? So probably doesn't help. Okay. So that recommendations is eat fish a couple times a week, which is hard if you're in the Midwest with no fresh, deep water. It's not harmful. Right. Um, but people who are also on blood thinners, it thins your, if you take high-dose fish oil, it actually can thin your blood more. So I, and I'm a less is more. I go through every patient's list and I say, why are you taking it? Why are you taking it? Why are you taking it? And they say, I don't know. I said, then ask the doctor who prescribed it or <laughs> why are you buying it and spending your money on it if it's over the counter? All right. Uh, so uh, keeping your weight under control, very important. Exercise is important. How important is diet? I mean, obviously it's got something to do with it because of the increasing rates of obesity and, and their indirectly heart disease. Diet, what do, you, what do you recommend? So most people, when they hear the word diet, a four-letter word, first of all. Um, they think about what I can't eat or what I have to eat less of. You're laughing. Well, it's true. <laughs> but, it, that, but it is true. That's Absolutely. what that dieting means, not eating as much. Right. I think uh, what we need to frame shift is there is ample evidence that says what we do eat, what we eat more of, actually can improve our heart health, can lower our blood pressure, and can make us healthier. And that's the focus I think we have to do is maybe – Yes, you want to eat, um, you don't need to eat 12 ounces of red meat every day. Um, but maybe you do need to eat six to nine servings of vegetables every day because that actually, and you may be full enough that you only need the six ounces of red meat. All right, we've been talking about heart health in women both during the reproductive years and after menopause with a specialist, cardio cardiologist, Dr. Sharon Hayes. Dr. Hayes, thanks so much for being with us. Thanks, it was great.